Our scripture this morning is from Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He hath shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with the Lord thy God. Heavenly Father, once again, we're so thankful to be with you on your special day, your holy Sabbath day, Lord. Now, as we open up thy word, we ask that you would open up our hearts, that you would guide us with your Holy Spirit, that we may rightfully understand the things that you want us to understand today. In Jesus' name, amen. He read Micah 6, 8. I would like to also read Luke 10, 27 and Matthew 16, 26. Luke 10, 27, so he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 16, 26, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? We believe that we love God. We come to church faithfully every Sabbath. We return a faithful tithe in offering. But how is this love demonstrated in our day-to-day lives? Loving God requires full commitment of our heart, soul, body, and mind every day. Anyone can say that he or she loves God, but doing so is another story. It requires a conscientious effort. Do we love our neighbors as ourselves? First of all, who is our neighbor? When God says, love your neighbor as yourself, who is he really talking about? Is he only talking about your church family? Is he only speaking about the people in your city? Or is it only Americans? When God says, love your neighbor as yourself, who is he really speaking about? As a Christian, as a follower of Christ, are we not taught to love Everyone. And loving everyone is Christ only referring to those who love me back. Right? Or is he speaking about those who hate hate you also? If we can't get how we are to love to treat others right, we won't get anything right. 1 John 4, 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. As followers of God, the core principle of the Christian is love. We must have an understanding of what love is. If we cannot change our hate for others to love for others, as God has commanded, will we be found in heaven? Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brother only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, You shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What is a neighbor? Or what is a friend or a neighbor? And what is an enemy? 
Our dictionary tells us that a friend is a person who one knows, that one likes, or one trusts, an acquaintance, a person who is allied with you or who is on your side, going through the same struggle or cause, a comrade, that's a friend. An enemy, on the other hand, is one who feels hatred towards you intends to injure you or oppose you a foe, one who opposes or is hostile to an idea or cause and is destructive or injurious in its effects. Most people never have a problem loving their friends. But what about their enemies? If the Christian cannot love his enemy, then what makes him any different than anyone else in the world? If we cannot love our enemies, then are we still children of God? And the words of Matthew that says, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, is, just, is that just a fable? Is that something that we say but don't really mean? Do we have the right to just ignore this? Or if we say we are a follower of Jesus Christ, we do good to those who hate us. We love our enemies. We bless those who curse us. And we pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that this is easy. It is not. But. When has the Christian life ever been easy? It is never easy going against the grain. When the entire world that we live in is in a downward spiral, especially when it comes to morals, it's not easy. Did you know that the beliefs that we hold true as Christians today are extreme beliefs compared to what the world believes? Believing that an unborn child has the right to life and not death is extreme. Believing that there's a difference between a man and a woman is extreme. Believing that there's only two types of people in the world is an extreme belief. Believing that we love our enemies as God has commanded us to do is extreme. Compared to what the world believes, saints, it is normal for the Christian to believe that the unborn child has a right to life. Why? Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. It is normal for the Christian to believe that there are only two sexes. Only two types of people in the world. It is normal, male and female. Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. It is normal for the Christian to believe that we love our enemies. Luke 6.35. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, be merciful just as your Father is also merciful. This is normal behavior for the followers of Christ. When we demonstrate love for our neighbors, especially our enemies, we are not demonstrating our love, but we are demonstrating God's love for them because we are ambassadors for God. Ambassadors do not represent themselves, do they? But represent someone else. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though Christ were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, 
to be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, once we accept Christ into our lives, we become ambassadors. We become examples of who Christ is. When people look at us, they ought to see Jesus living within us. The love that Jesus has shown us is reflected in our lives, and everyone can see the love of Christ dwelling in us. The church is supposed to be a reflection of who Jesus is, which means we are no longer doing the same thing that the world is doing. There has to be a change in our lives. We are no longer filled with hate for the brethren, but we are filled with the love of Christ in us. His blood, Christ's blood, is now flowing through our veins now the love that Christ has in his heart is transferred to us, and those around us will see it, and they will feel it. Why would anyone come into this church? If the church is still doing the same things, acting the same way that the world is acting, why would anyone come in? The world must see a change in us. They must see that we no longer have hate in our hearts, but only love because we have been with Jesus and he has changed our hearts. What type of examples are we? Are we the Jesus that the ones around us, we are the Jesus that the ones around us will ever see, right? Are we displaying the love to others that God has required of us? If you want to see Jesus, Loving your enemies is a requirement. If you expect to live in that heavenly city, loving your enemies is not the exception, but the rule. We just ran Matthew. Now let's take a look at Luke, just in case we didn't understand what Matthew was saying. Luke 6, 27, 31. Luke 6, 27 to 31. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one tree, one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either, give it to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Hmm. That lovely coat that you just bought, that you just love so much. You're going to give it away? Somebody didn't need it? Isn't that what the Bible is saying? Hmm. What does this mean? It means that we treat others the way we want to be treated, period, right? We treat others the way... Actually, we treat others the way God has treated us, not the way someone else has treated us. Verses 32 to 36, still in Luke 6. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. You know, everyone has that family member that always wants to borrow some money from you. I don't have to say it, do I? You'll be like, when are they going to pay me back? Right? I want it back. What does the Bible say? Don't worry about it. Right? We're different. We're no longer like the world is. We're different because we have received Christ into our lives. Love your enemies, do good and limb, hoping for nothing in return, but, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. 
for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. And we call ourselves children of God. So we ought to be kind to who? The unthankful and the evil. Why? Because we are children of God. You know, we have been so hypnotized in believing that what the world believes is what we are supposed to believe also. We hate others who hate us. We want to do evil to those who do evil to us. If they're not nice to us, we're not going to be nice to them. When has that ever been the life of a Christian? The world is so ingrained in us that we have lost our focus of who Jesus is to us. Where is the change in our hearts that Christ wants to make in us? Saints of the living God, if you still have hate in your heart for anyone else, for anyone else, and then you do not know who Jesus is. If you still have hate in your heart for anyone, Jesus has not found a place in your heart. The enemy, the devil, still has your heart, and we have to repent. One of the signs that you have moved from death to life is you have made the change in your heart from evil, from hate to love. When this change happens, you can truly love your enemies as yourself. Until that happens, you're not saved. Until you have made a complete conversion, you are not saved. The only person you are fooling is yourself. God is love. And though only those who have learned to love as God has loved you which means especially your enemies, will be found in heaven. If you cannot love your enemies as God has commanded you to do, then you will be found in hell with your enemies. Why? We have to let our hate go. We have to release it. Let it go. There will be no haters in heaven. Think about that. Are there going to be any haters in heaven? So if we still hating on somebody down here, will we be found in heaven? That's, you know, it's a simple, simple equation. Loving your enemies is not about your enemies anyway. i let that sink in. Loving your enemies is not about your enemies. It's about you. It's about yourself. It's about who you are. And you have become in Jesus Christ. Does Christ love the evil people in our world? Of course he does, right? He died for the whole world, right? We know Romans 5.10. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He died for his enemies, not for his friends. He didn't have any friends down here. Does Jesus love our evil actions? Of course not. He does not. So if our example, Jesus loves the person but hates the actions of the person, yes, we can hate the actions. So we are to love the person and hate the actions also, right? There's a difference. Most of us have not changed from earthly, from an earthly mindset to a heavenly mindset. So what's the difference? The earthly mindset, I do unto others as others has done unto me. And that we hear that all the time. I'm going to do you worse than what you did to me. Right? I mean, we hear that all the time, right? And we believe it. You know, we call ourselves Christians, but we believe that saying. I'm going to do you better or worse. You step on my toes, I'm stepping on both your toes. Right? The heavenly mindset is I do unto others as Christ has done unto me. Right? That's the change. 
I do unto others as Christ has done unto me. Only God can remove change and get rid of our hate. God has sent his son to change our minds to change the way we think. So when our mind changes, our actions will change also. We have been taught to do unto others as others has done unto us, but God is teaching us to love others as he has loved us. Now we treat others the way God has treated us and not as others have treated us. What matters is that God has made a change in my heart so that now I can help make a change in my enemy's heart. We are to love our enemies. They need to see the change in us from what we used to be. We are the Jesus that those around us will ever see. Do we reflect the character of Jesus for, for them to see it? Are we reflecting that Jesus character so that our friends and especially our enemies see who God is? See the love of God. There will be no haters found in heaven. Hate is not a part of the kingdom of God. Only love is. So if you still have hate in your heart for your neighbor, you will not be found in heaven. There will be no hateful people in heaven. There will not be one person who hates another person found in heaven. The time for removing hate from our lives is right now. You know, I'm a veteran. But not just any veteran. I'm a war veteran. You know, I went to war. But, you know, I was blessed and looking back so much, I'm like, wow, Lord, bless me, because I didn't have to kill anybody. Oh, now I should have got an amen all over the place. <laughs> I went to war, and God blessed me that I didn't have to kill anyone. That's huge. You know, and I was a young Christian at the time, right? Today, my mind said I'm a little more mature. I say a little more mature. <laughs> I would never go to war to kill anyone. Today, I have a little more love in my heart. I understand a little more than I did yesterday. Today, I would rather be found with Stephen, who was stoned to death. I would rather be found with the other Christian martyrs of the first century to the present century who were killed and are still being killed for their faith in God. For their belief in God, for their love of the true and only God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And not for my belief in the United States of America. Our heroes are to be those people who gave up their lives for their faith of a believing in God. Of knowing that we suffer loving God, believing that if we are faithful, if we have truly reflected the love that is in us through Jesus Christ, he will raise us up in the last day. So we don't have to worry about death. Death for the Christian is only sleep. Right? Death for the Christian is called sleep. Why? Because Jesus will raise his children up at the last day to live with him forever. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 18 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, excuse me, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means, means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself 
with a sin from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Saints, if we remain faithful, God has promised us eternal life. Death is but a sleep for the Christian, for the true follower of Christ, because God has promised he will raise us up in the last day to meet Jesus in the air. You know, the time of trouble is right before us. Are you ready? Are you spiritually ready if you still have hate in your heart, my friends, for anybody? Then you're still not ready. You are not ready. Only those who have learned to love the way Jesus loves us are ready. How long have we been Christians, saints? How long? So why do we still have hate in our hearts for others? Knowing what Christ has done for us. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, growing up, my favorite movies were war movies. Today, my favorite movies are still war movies. <laughs> But now, my favorite war story is Hacksaw Ridge. Hacksaw Ridge is a story of Desmond Doss. Desmond Doss was a young Adventist. He was a real Christian, a conscientious objector who refused to carry a rifle, and he served as a medic. Desmond was awarded the Medal of Honor, the highest medal you can be awarded in the United States. He saved approximately 75 men, both of the American Army and the Japanese Army. Those who were trying to kill him, he saved. Let that sink in a little bit. Desmond saved the very ones who was trying to kill him. He saved both his friends and his enemies. And at the time, his friends was no better than his enemies. Before they went to war, while they were still in training, it was his friends who gave him a beatdown. His fellow shoulder, shoulders Showed, <laughs> yes, <laughs> beat him to a pope. His fellow soldiers beat Desmond to a pope. With friends like these, who needs enemies? All because he refused to carry a rifle. But Desmond remained faithful. Faithful. He continued to show love to his enemies and his fellow soldiers who were supposed to be his friends by saving their lives. And because of his faithfulness to God, he had a great impact on his fellow soldiers. You know, Desmond had a father who was in the army. And so his father distilled, put it in Desmond's mind that it was his duty to go to serve his country. You know, I can identify because my father was also in the Army. And I can remember over and over again that he would teach us that we all need to go serve our country. And we all said we were not. I have three brothers. We all said we're not going, but one by one. My oldest brother went into the Marine Corps. My second brother went into the Marine Corps. My last brother, my youngest brother, said he was going. I talked him out of it. 
And then later on, we both went. The saying is true. Teach a child in the way that he shall go and he shall not depart from it. We were, so I can understand Desmond, even though he has that religious background and understanding, because of the impact of his father, he went into the service. But he went in as a conscientious director. Desmond continued to show love to his enemies and his fellow shovers who were supposed to be his friends by saving their lives. And because of his faithfulness to God, he had a great impact on his fellow soldiers. His impact was so great that his commanding officer refused to go fight the next battle unless Desmond went, went with them. It was Sabbath morning. Desmond's commander believed that his soldiers would not want to go fight unless Desmond was with them. What a testimony. His same friends who beat him up now don't want to go to the battlefield without Desmond. Sabbath morning, the entire regiment waited until Desmond had prayed to his God, until Desmond had worship with his God. That morning, as Desmond was still in prayer, the general called Desmond commander asked him, what is he waiting on? The battle should have already started. His commander had to say, we are waiting on Desmond to finish his prayer to his God. We are waiting on Desmond to finish his worship to his God. In your battles that you face every day, do you worship and pray to your God before you go into battle? Do you pray for your friends and your enemies? Are you showing love to your friend and your enemies? We are in a battle, and it is a battle to remove hate from our lives, from our minds. If we are to be found in heaven, hate has to go. Hate has to be removed from our minds and replaced with the love that God has given us through his son. John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The evidence that we have been saved, that we have moved from death to life, is that we now have learned to love our enemies as ourselves, the way that God loves us. If we cannot love our enemies the way that God loves us, we are not children of God. The Bible says that God is love. So if we expect to partake of and be found in God's king kingdom, who must we be? If we expect to be found in God's kingdom, what type of people are we supposed to be? We must be a people who loves everybody. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, beloved. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
I cannot make it any clearer than that. We are to love others the way God has loved us, period. Now, martyrs are those who give up their lives for others or for their beliefs. It is more important to die for what you believe in than to live for what you don't believe in. Christ gave up his life for you and for me. Stephen gave up his life for others. All the disciples paid a heavy price with their lives. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a fairly modern book about Christians, martyrs who gave up their lives because they loved God more than themselves. Ephesians 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for his enemies. Are you willing to die for your enemies? When you are willing to die for your enemies, now that's love. That's love. Heavenly Father, once again, we're so grateful for your mercy toward us, Lord. We're so grateful that you saw fit to send your only son to die in our place because we cannot die for ourselves and live. All we have to do is accept the mercy, the love that you have given us through your son, Jesus. And we ask, you, oh, Heavenly Father, that you continue to change our minds, remove the hate from our hearts, and implant the love that you have for us, that you've given to us. And help us to be an example for others so that we may all be found in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.